Welcome to the Tom Woods Show, episode 322. I enjoyed a nice long weekend with the family, so there was no episode yesterday, January 19th, 2015. But here we are with episode 322, and for this episode, I'm taking the advice, I'm following the suggestion of somebody on my Facebook page who suggested that I talk about Lysander Spooner, that we've not had an episode on Lysander Spooner. I thought, oh, that can't be. Over 320 episodes? Of course we've done an episode. Uh, It turns out we haven't. Have not done an episode on Lysander Spooner. So my first instinct always is, who would be a good guest to invite to talk about Lysander Spooner? And then I thought, well, why don't I talk about Lysander Spooner? I know a little bit about the subject. I want to talk about a couple of his works and his ideas. He's a very interesting guy. He's the kind of guy, he's like Frederick Bastiat. You read him, and you're changed afterward. Even if you're not completely converted, your mind has been opened to possibilities you have not entertained before. And I, I just hear his name coming up over and over again. In terms of 19th century figures who have influenced living libertarians, I just hear Spooner over and over again, maybe, maybe as often as I hear Bastiat, actually. A lot of people talk about The Law by Frederick Bastiat, but I would say just as many, at least Americans anyway, talk about No Treason by Lysander Spooner. So I thought, what the heck, let's talk about Lysander Spooner a little bit today. Very, very interesting person. There's so much to say about him because he had opinions on a wide variety of subjects, but I'm going to confine myself to two works I want to talk about his work, The Unconstitutionality of Slavery, from 1845. And then down in 1867, we have his work, No Treason, The Constitution of No Authority. One quick thing before we get started, remember this Saturday, January 25th, is the Mises Circle in Houston, featuring Ron Paul, Lou Rockwell, Brian McClanahan, who's also been a guest on this show, and Jeff Deist. Yeah, everybody in that lineup has been a guest on this show. It's in Houston. The details are at TomWoods.com on the events page. So check that out. I've got a bunch of events coming up this year. I haven't put them all up yet because we're still finalizing them, but looks like I'll be in Florida and in Alabama, Washington, D.C., Brazil, very likely now, and uh, Montreal. Oh, and as a matter of fact, I I guess I forgot uh, Ireland, also Ireland in May. Uh, in Dublin. So I'll be putting all those up very soon over at TomWoods.com. And of course, via my newsletter, which you can get at TomWoods.com. Also, it's unobtrusive. It comes eh, three times a month, maybe once a week if I'm super ambitious. And I try to make sure that it's useful for you guys and packed with good information. So check that out, TomWoods.com. You also get a free ebook when you sign up for it. Okay, let's talk about Spooner, who lived from 1808 to 1887. And this guy, throughout his life, he's just against the state. He is the enemy of the state like Murray Rothbard in many ways. He starts up his own mail delivery company to compete with the U.S. Postal Service, the American Letter Mail Company, and eventually the government shut him down in 1851. He was underselling them, he was offering better service, as you would expect, and they can't have that, so they shut him down. I want to talk about, later on, I want to talk about his anti-slavery work. For now, in in terms of his legal work and his pro bono work that he did and his activism, his support for John Brown, I want to get to that a little later. Right now, I want to talk about his, his published work in opposition to slavery, and in particular, his work, The Unconstitutionality of Slavery, 1845. This is a very, very interesting work because, for one thing, it runs counter to the mainstream of abolitionism at that time. The mainstream of abolitionism was not particularly pleased with the Constitution. As a matter of fact, William Lloyd Garrison, the publisher of The Liberator, the outstanding abolitionist newspaper, uh, he was uh, based in Massachusetts, Garrison had this to say about the Constitution. He said, There is much declamation about the sacredness of the compact which was formed between the free and slave states on the adoption of the Constitution. A sacred compact, forsooth. We pronounce it, we abolitionists, that is, the most bloody and heaven-daring arrangement ever made by men for the continuance and protection of a system of the most atrocious villainy ever exhibited on earth. Yes, we recognize the compact, but with feelings of shame and indignation, 
and it will be held in everlasting infamy by the friends of justice and humanity throughout the world. It was a compact formed at the sacrifice of the bodies and souls of millions of our race for the sake of achieving a political object, an unblushing and monstrous coalition to do evil that good might come. That's obviously a reference to St. Paul. Such a compact was in the nature of things and according to the law of God, null and void from the beginning. No body of men ever had the right to guarantee the holding of human beings in bondage. Who or what were the framers of our government that they should dare confirm and authorize such high-handed villainy, such a flagrant robbery of the inalienable rights of man, such a glaring violation of all the precepts and injunctions of the gospel, such a savage war upon a sixth part of our whole population? They were men like ourselves, as fallible, as sinful, as weak as ourselves. By the infamous bargain which they made between themselves, they virtually dethroned the Most High God and trampled beneath their feet their own solemn and heaven-attested declaration that all men are created equal and endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Well, you can get a sense there of how Garrison feels about the Constitution, not particularly thrilled. So what's interesting about Spooner is that he's going to argue that, to the contrary, the Constitution does not, in fact, uphold slavery. And it's a very interesting argument he makes. It's an argument, by the way, that persuaded Frederick Douglass, of course, the ex-slave-turned-abolitionist who had been a Garrisonian on this issue, and then he read the unconstitutionality of slavery and was converted to Spooner's point of view. Now, to understand Spooner's point of view, we have to understand the way he approached the Constitution. Now, he's going to approach the Constitution somewhat differently later in life when we get to no treason. But here, he says, the way we should interpret the Constitution is by means of something called original meaning. And we contrast this with the method of interpretation known as original intent. That's the method we associate with people like Robert Bork, or Antonin Scalia on the Supreme Court, where they try to figure out what the original intention of those drafting and ratifying the Constitution had been when they approved it. I mean, really, it's the ratifiers that you look to more than the, the drafters. And that's what original intent is all about. We say, what was the original intent behind this clause? What was this clause supposed to mean? And then they use their conclusions about original intent to come up with their decisions. Spooner is going to discard this view. His view is that it's largely inscrutable. When you're trying to figure out original intent, you can't really know what the original intent behind something was. But one thing that you can know is the original meaning of the words that were used. Let's just look at the words that were used. Let's not try to figure out what was in somebody's head at a particular moment. Let's look at the words on the page, and let's understand the words on the page the way they were understood at the time they were written. We have to understand what these words meant in the late 18th century. Now, Spooner is also going to say that natural law, in effect, demands human freedom, that there are certain principles about how to live your life that we imbibe as children. You know, don't hit that other kid. Don't take that other kid's stuff. These are things we know to be right. And therefore, we know that the contrary proposition is wrong, that you should hit that kid. You should take that kid's stuff, or you have no right to complain when you get hit or when you are burglarized. In other words, all of us are entitled to liberty. Liberty is the cornerstone of natural law liberty, that everyone is entitled to liberty, and that any contrary proposition violates these basic views that we all share about proper human conduct. Now, Spooner's going to take that proposition that he just made about freedom being essential to natural law, and he's going to say, this is going to inform my interpretation of the Constitution. Because I want to look at the original meaning of the words that were used. And if I find anyone proposing that a particular constitutional clause violates human liberty, 
then I'm going to look at that clause very, very carefully. I'm going to unpack the meanings of all those words. And I'm going to see if there's any other way to interpret that clause. Rather than simply going along with that interpretation, I'm going to look very closely at the meanings of the words in that clause. What did these words mean in the 18th century? And see if there may be an inoffensive interpretation of the clause. And if there are two possible interpretations, the natural law should arbitrate between the two. In other words, the one that is friendlier to human liberty is the one that is to be preferred, even if I appear to be straining the interpretation to pull it in the direction of liberty. Never should we strain to interpret a clause away from human liberty. If we must strain in our interpretation, we must do so in the direction of liberty. That's how he's going to interpret the Constitution. He's going to do his best to make sure that it's interpreted in the most pro-freedom way the words themselves can possibly allow. So let's take a look at the Constitution and clauses in which we see, or at least we've been taught to see, references to slavery, and see how Spooner deals with them. How does he handle, for example, the Fugitive Slave Clause? That seems pretty clearly a reference to slavery. But Spooner will say, the word slavery does not appear anywhere in the Constitution. So I'm not just going to assume automatically the existence of slavery. If it's the, wor the word is not in there, then we never, ever would give an institution as odious as this the benefit of the doubt. To the contrary, we will assume it does not exist if it is not actually mentioned specifically using language that we can interpret in no other way. Well, let's look at Article 4, Section 2, which is the Fugitive Slave Clause. I'll read it to you. And, if, of course, actually, it's, I'm reading it to you not just for educational purposes, but also because we want to see this language in order to see Spooner's point. It reads, No person held to service or labor in one state under the laws thereof, escaping into another, shall, in consequence of any law or regulation therein, be discharged from such service or labor, but shall be delivered up on claim of the party to whom such service or labor may be due. All right, that's the Fugitive Slave Clause, that if you are a slave in one state and you escape into another state, you are not freed from your labor that's owed to your master, but you are to be delivered up to that person. That's how we all typically interpret that clause. But here's how Spooner deals with it. He said, and by the way, he has very lengthy exegesis of the several clauses we're going to look at here. I'm just pulling out one or two of his arguments, but his, his text is full of supplementary claims, so I don't want to make it seem as if he's got three sentences worth of rebuttal. Uh, that's absolutely untrue. In the show notes page for today, I'll make sure and link to the works that I'm referring to and quoting from. So, of course, today's uh, show notes page will be tomwoods.com slash 322. All right, back to Spooner. He says, neither service nor labor, these words we see in Article 4, Section 2, is necessarily slavery. And not being necessarily slavery, the words cannot, in this case, be strained beyond their necessary meaning to make them sanction a wrong. The law will not allow words to be strained a hair's breadth beyond their necessary meaning to make them authorize a wrong. The stretching, if there be any, must always be towards the right. The words service or labor do not necessarily, nor in their common acceptation, so much as suggest the idea of slavery. That is, they do not suggest the idea of the laborer or servant being the property of the person for whom he labors. An indented apprentice serves and labors for another. He is held to do so under a contract and for a consideration that are recognized by the laws as legitimate and consistent with natural right. Yet he is not owned as property. A condemned criminal is held to labor. Yet he is not owned as property. The law allows no such straining of the meaning of words towards the wrong as that which would convert the words service or labor 
of men into property in man, and thus make a man who serves or labors for another the property of that other. So that's how Spooner deals with the fugitive slave clause, that these words don't necessarily mean slavery, therefore we can't interpret them as meaning slavery. Secondly, let's deal with the three-fifths clause. The three-fifths clause from Article 1, Section 2 reads as follows. Representatives and direct taxes shall be apportioned among the several states which may be included within this union according to their respective numbers, which shall be determined by adding to the whole number of free persons, including those bound to service for a term of years, and excluding Indians not taxed, three-fifths of all other persons. All right, so how's he going to deal with this one? This is the clause that we typically take to refer to apportionment, and that for purposes of apportionment, we will treat slaves as three-fifths of a free white man. And of course, you know, you get all these high school and college kids who know nothing and say, oh my goodness, how terrible. They were speculating on what fraction of a man a slave was. And oh my goodness, how terrible this is. Okay, well, it's obviously an awkward compromise. This is my digression, by the way. It's obviously fairly awkward, but they were not engaged in some kind of metaphysical speculation as to what fraction of a human being an African slave was. They, they were not, there was nobody saying, well, I say they're four-sevenths of a person. No, 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 I say they're five-thirty-seconds. Nobody was saying that. The point was that the North wanted them to count as zero, and the South wanted them to count as one. So they came up with this, well, every five of them will count as three, and that's how we'll deal with this compromise. There was no attempt to decide what fraction of a person. To the contrary, it was the slaveholders who wanted them to count as a full person. So, I, I, you know, obviously nobody is particularly thrilled about this clause, but obviously to solve this problem by siding with the South and saying, well, we'll count them all as one, would have given the slaveholders much more political power. So I don't know why people who are upset about it would say that the solution to this was to give the South much more political power by counting five slaves as five persons. But anyway, that... That's what you get for sitting in a government school all day long. Well, anyway, Spooner's going to look at this and say this has nothing to do with slavery, or it doesn't have to have anything to do with slavery. He says the way we get slavery out of this, just on the basis of the language alone, is by contrasting free with all other persons. Because in the language that I just read to you, we've got adding to the whole number of free persons and then three-fifths of all other persons, well, the other persons must therefore be unfree. And therefore, we get the strong implication that we're talking about slavery. But he says, look, English law had for centuries used the word free as describing persons possessing citizenship or some other franchise or peculiar privilege as distinguished from aliens and persons not possessed of such franchise or privilege. So therefore, talking about people who are not free would simply, in this case, mean people like resident aliens. It does not have to mean slaves. So why should we make it mean slaves? And then finally, let's look at the clause pertaining to the slave trade, which cannot be ended until the year 1808. Article 1, Section 9 reads, and now think of this, by the way, This is what Spooner would want you to do as a thought experiment. Think of this the way you would think of it if you knew nothing about American history. You knew none of the background information. All you were hearing were these words. And you didn't know anything about any debates over these words or anything like that. All you hear are these words. You tell me if these words compel you to admit the existence of slavery as a legal institution in the United States. Reads as follows. The migration or importation of such persons as any of the states now existing shall think proper to admit shall not be prohibited by the Congress prior to the year 1808. But a tax or duty may be imposed on such importation not exceeding $10 for each person. Okay, where is slavery in that? 
Where is slavery? Spooner says, there is no judge in the world who, if he, if he were given these words, these words alone would read slavery into them. There is no reason we can't read this as simply saying that the migration of people into the United States will be unimpeded by any congressional law until the year 1808. There's no reason we can't read it that way. So that is the way we ought to read it, and that is the way the precepts of the natural law compel us to read it. All right, so that's an overview of the unconstitutionality of slavery, and I think you'll agree with me that it's very interesting, very interestingly argued, in some ways quite compellingly argued, even from the point of view of constitutional exegesis. It, it, it seems quite different from methods of interpretation that we're familiar with, but throughout the work, he gives legal precedence for his manner of interpretation. Uh, I mean, it's, it's worth considering. It's very much worth considering. Of course, we all want to read the Constitution in an anti-slavery way, if we possibly can. I, I think that would be better. I mean, it's a bit moot at this point, but I, I think it's very, very interesting what he's trying to do here. Of course, there is plenty to be said for Garrison. I don't mean to say that he's a bad guy because he disagrees with Spooner. I mentioned Garrison just by way of comparison, just so that you would know what the context is, that Spooner is actually taking the minority position among abolitionists in saying that the Constitution is, in fact, not pro-slavery. But anyway, very interesting material. Let's say a little bit more about Spooner and slavery, and then I think, I think I'm going to make this into two episodes. Tomorrow I'll talk about his stuff about the Constitution that he wrote in the 1860s, about whether the Constitution actually binds anybody. And this is the work of Spooner's that really, I think, compels people. That you, you really can't see any good arguments against it. And one wonderful thing about my wife is that without ever having read Spooner, in fact, without having heard of Spooner, this is very early in the marriage, obviously, she hadn't heard of Spooner yet, but she more or less voiced to me Spooner's view of the Constitution and said, well, why isn't this correct? I said, where'd you get that idea? Well, I just thought of it. Oh, man, did I make a good choice here with her. All right, uh, just very quickly, he didn't just write the unconstitutionality of slavery. I mentioned earlier that he did, uh, he sometimes worked for free as a lawyer for fugitive slaves. He, he proposed that people should use jury nullification to help escaped slaves, uh, you know, beat the rap, so to speak. I mean, he favored that. He developed, this is very much worth reading, by the way. I'm going to link to it on the show notes page, tomwoods.com slash 322. You really should read it for yourself. His plan for the abolition of slavery, which he released in 1858. I mean, this is hardcore. He's talking about insurrection in the South, backed by the North, and he's talking about confiscation of slaveholders' property, He's, he's got a number of principles that he lays out in introducing this plan for the abolition of slavery, that the slaves have the natural right to their liberty, they have a natural right to compensation for the wrongs they've suffered, that so long as the governments under which they live refuse to give them liberty or compensation, they have the right to take it by stratagem or force. And then, she sa then he says that it's the duty of all who can to assist them in such an enterprise. He also supported John Brown, uh, the, the abolitionist for whom he raised money, uh, and he actually developed a plan to kidnap the governor of Virginia until John Brown was released. So Spooner was deeply devoted to the anti-slavery cause and yet totally opposed to the war that Abraham Lincoln waged, totally opposed to it. He thought it was completely hypocritical, totally transparent, that it was not how slavery ought to be abolished, but also that this was not the purpose for which the war was being fought. And he said, in fact, the principle, these are his words, the principle on which the war was waged by the North was simply this, that men may rightfully be compelled to submit to and support a government that they do not want, and that resistance on their part makes them traitors and criminals. He did not buy any of it at all. He believed in the absolute right of secession, but he also believed in guerrilla insurrections against the institution of slavery. So a radical thinker all around. All right, that's the show for today. But before I let you go, I'd like to ask you one favor, if I may, and this will actually take you less than a minute. I'm not kidding. It will take you less than a minute. I'm trying to get a handle on who listens to the show. Now, I don't mean numbers. I have a sense of numbers. 
but in terms of the composition of the audience, I'd like to know. So if you could help me out, head over to tomwoods.com slash survey. As I say, it'll take you less than a minute. And by the way, the occasional old browser has trouble with my redirect plugin. So you may have to type in www.tomwoods.com slash survey. But I would really, really appreciate that. If you could just take a moment to do that for me, that would really be great. All right, I hope you guys are enjoying the show. Please help spread the word. Link to the episodes on Facebook and Twitter. Let's get the word out there. I've got so many people who, you know, when I go to speaking events, I've had over 300 episodes, and they say, oh, you have a show? How interesting. They have no idea. I don't know how to get to these people. you got to help me reach these people. Let them know there's a show going on. There are over 320 episodes. We're all having a blast with it. So please help me out in that uh, respect. More Lysander Spooner tomorrow. We'll see you then. Thanks for listening, everybody. The Tom Woods Show.